Pues buenas noches a todos. Guten Abend. Hallo, Leute. Ich werde die Vorstellung auf Deutsch machen, dann auf Englisch. Für die. Oder mache ich keine Fehler? Ja, so, das ist ähm, der letzte Vortrag des Wintersemesters von unserer Seite, von der mexikanischen Gruppe. Ähm, wir hatten schon einige Vorträge hier in der KHW gemacht, dieses Wintersemester, und jetzt planen wir auch schon die Vorträge für den Sommersemester. Und das dient heute erst als Einführung für einen Kochkurs, den wir geplant haben für den nächsten Monat. Also dann erstmal die, die Vorspeise, <lacht> die Appetizer für den Kurs. <lacht> Und dann kommt dann der Manus in Das Programm ist der Programm der Manus in Das ist ein Spielfassbeispiel. Ähm, es soll, uh, this will be just uh, an introduction. Talk for the course will be which will take place next week. This is the last talk we are going to give this semester, winter semester. Uh, we were giving already a few talks and a few films here in the Kahali. And we are planning the talks for the summer semester already also. So um, please be attend of the program. And uh, we have five talks and most probably a uh, a uh, short film evening with short film from Latin America. We still have to plan that in more detail, but hopefully it works. And this will be as appetizer just for the cooking course that is going to take next week on Friday. So she will give some advertisement. And uh, well, the speaker is Alina Neitzke. Uh, she's making her master degree here at the university in Spanish and English. And her thesis topic is uh, the influence of Mexican food in the work of uh, Sandra Cisneros, who's is a Chicana writer. Really? And that's why it's <laughs> good. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why she was so interested in the topic in, in Mexico. She was living in Mexico already for a few months uh, and as a change, so she speaks very well Spanish. And uh, she's that's why also interested in the food, and uh, it was a nice uh, um, contribution, well, collaboration between Luis, who is going, the one who's going to give the course next week, and today the theoretical part from me. So, yeah, thank you. So I decided to speak in English. I hope that's fine for everyone because not everyone can speak um, Spanish. I heard so. I hope that's all right for you. Mm -hmm. If you have any questions, you can get a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little Okay. Um, and if you have questions about the content, feel also free to interrupt me. But be a bit patient because I can only talk about one aspect at a time. So just maybe wait for the next point to be spoken about and then as whatever you would like to know more about. So my topic is Comida Mexicana, Contexto y Representación Artística. So what I would like to do with you today is um, travel along the culinary timeline of Mexican cuisine. Um, so you see the first point here, which is like approximately um, in the first 500 years um, yeah, after, after um, we started to count time. So the first evidence of clay griddles, um, so-called comales, in case you've heard of that word, um, were dated back to this period. So um, those were used for cooking tortillas and for toasting seeds. Um, but this, yeah, do you have a question about the comal? Does everyone know what a comal is? Like a cray griddle. So, <laughs> so a comal. Um, you can start writing the words in the book. Oh, yeah, I can. Oh, yeah, but we'll see it. Oh, you want to write it? Just to look if it's not the one That already happened to us. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so a comal. 
um, based on the word Komali, which is which language? Yes, right. <laughs> so it's a it's a kind of flat plate like a pen, approximately thirty centimeters, and it's made out of clay, tone. And um, back then, people used it to make tortillas, but also still nowadays people use that. So it's really important. And in pre-Hispanic kitchens, they used to place it on three stones. Those stones were holy, so you were not allowed to step on them. And um, underneath, they arranged the fire and then cooked the tortillas on top of that. But, of course, not only tortillas were important, but also something else. I heard there was also a presentation about that today. So thank you for being here in my presentation. So that's... Um, and now a poem here. I can't really remember how to pronounce now, so maybe Lisa would like to read it for us uh, yeah, <laughs> because, because she studies now. Okay, she moketsa she tsona, and then it's yamikwa kakaot, it no paki, no yod awina, no yod waigama. Okay. It's actually quite easy for us for Phil to understand, right? Yeah. It's almost yeah. the same. Except yeah. for the the X, it's pronounced Dutch. So. Yeah. Yeah. So when the Spaniards arrived um, to yeah, to the New World, like from their point of view, um, they started developing <coughs> writing to transcribe Nahuatl, and of course that's that's why it's easy for Spanish speakers to pronounce it, because they used their um, alphabet and their phonemes. Yeah, so in English it would be like, I drink cacao, with it I'm glad, and my heart takes pleasure, and my heart is happy. So as you can see, <laughs> like cacao, your heart is also happy. Yeah. My heart is also always really happy, and Nizawakoyotis, heart was obviously also happy. This dates back to the 15th century, more or less. Nizawakoyote, was the monarch of the and um, which is the Nahuatl people. So it's not the Aztecs, but it's another people, but their language was also Nahuatl. And maybe if you know something about the Mexican money, on the 100 pesos bill, you can find a poem by Nesawakoyote. So he's quite famous. This poem doesn't have anything to do with food, but this one does, I think. The Mexicans here, do you all know him? Sorry? Yeah? Did you all know him? Do you all know this poet? The poem? No. The poem, yeah. The poem, yeah. The poet. Well, now, yeah, this one. Uh, yeah. It's, it's a very famous one. Yeah. For those who don't know, check your check a 100 peso bill, and it will be there. It's really tiny and hard to see. Maybe you, you need to look really closely, but do you have one? That's no. no. Not too nice. I don't have one either, unfortunately. Yeah, and um, in the upper right corner you can see a statue, and that's an, an Aztec sculpture, and it dates back to approximately um, 1200 to 1521, more or less, and now it's in the Brooklyn Museum of Art, and it's a man with a cacao pot. So, as you can see, cacao isn't really anything new. Modern. Is it in New York? Or just in, Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. in Brooklyn. Yes. Yeah, this one is a poem that refers to maize again, or corn. Um, it's the song that was um, chanted every eight years at the Feast of the Water Tamales um, on the day of the one flower, which is the day um, when the cycle of the planet Venus um, crosses the cycle of the sun, and um, according to myth, on that day, um, Teotl, Teotl means, means God, um, the Earth Mother, gave birth to Zintuetl, um, the corn deity, on that day. So that's why every eight years, um, this ritual um, can be witnessed, and that's what also Frey Bernardin de Saint-Boon did. Maybe some of you have heard about him. Um, he is a um, frail, and he worked in the convent of Xochimilco, 
actually the Pacific of Mexico City. Um, quite nice and pretty rich area nowadays. And yeah, he was really interested in the Aztec culture and transcribed many rituals, so it was really important for history. And you can see that horn back then was also really important. So yeah, if you want to know about the Mesoamerican diet, because obviously Mexico didn't really exist back then, there were really pre-Hispanic peoples in the area we now call Mexico, but of course back then like, we had different limits of a country or like of different um, yeah, different peoples, empires. So before the arrival of the Europeans, you can basically say that in Mesoamerica there was a common substratum. So um, pre-Hispanic people um, relied more or less on beans, on maize, and squash. Squashes um, can be equivalent to zucchini calabaza and chili peppers, and their prone protein source was turkey, dogs, yeah, they ate dogs. So, and these dogs still exist today. These dogs are called Choloitz Queensland. I think all, all of the Mexicans probably know that dog. I think there's a park in Xochimilco where they still live and you can have a look at them. Yeah, so, but they don't eat them today anymore, not as, I don't, I'm not so sure, but uh, I don't think so. <laughs> so poor Chinese people. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but that's that was their own um, their only really domesticated animal. They um, they could rely on when it came to protein. They ate frogs and waterfowls, fish, salamander, and insects and eggs. And um, as most of you will know, insects are also still eaten today. Chapulines, grillos, there are really nice tacos with grillos and chapulines, with limon and sal, can be pretty nice. Also, one really has to be really concentrated to try it for the first time. Did you try it? Yeah, I tried it and it was really hard. It took me a long time to do it, but it's actually pretty nice, pretty crispy, and with lemon and salt, it's really nice. You just have to think about something else, I guess, for the first time. Yeah, and the fruits um, they relied on was plum, cherimoya. You know what cherimoya is? We know. You know? Mexicans know? Yeah, cherimoya. Um, do you know the term is now? No, I don't. <laughs> is the term now? You know, ceremony? Um, but you could, you could find a female. I've, I've seen it. Yeah, it's not so easy, but you could find a female. Yeah, it's like mm, pretty small. I first tried it in Spain. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. Mm. But ceremony, yeah, I don't think it's now. It doesn't sound no. now. No, it doesn't sound so much. But, yeah, I don't mm. think so. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like cherry, but. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I don't know about that. Yeah. Also, there was choke cherry, which also sounds like cherry, um, which is the dark cherry sour version. Mm -hmm. And um, also crab apples. Crab apples are really small red fruits. Um, blackberries. We all know blackberries. Guava. Do you know guava? Um, guava. Wow. 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 Guava. Mm -hmm. In Spanish, it's guayabana. Yeah. Ah, yeah, guayabana. Yeah. So it's also a little fruit. It's a, it's a little hard to explain. Um, you can make juice out of it, and it's really good. Yeah, I recommend you to try that one in case you find it one of those days. Yeah, and zapotes. Um, that's not what you yeah. probably figured. It comes from zapote. Um, yeah, also, also a little fruit, greenish kind of, um, yeah, avocado, of course, and mame. My earrings are made of mame, mame, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the skin of mame. But, yeah, I wouldn't know how to describe mame. I think you would really have to try it yourself. Yeah, and the beverages, pulque, you know what pulque is? Um, pulque. <laughs> 
Yeah, Pulque is um, an alcoholic drink. So yeah, in Mesoamerica they were already drinking quite some alcohol, and it's made out of the fermented um, juice of the agave, so like tequila, but it's fermented, and it looks a little bit milky, and it's a bit cheaper than tequila as well. And there are lots of pulquerias now nowadays in Mexico, so you can still enjoy that drink. And atole, which is a drink on, on the base of maize. Um, and you can still buy that today, mostly instant, like powder, and then you just add milk, and it can be flavored with strawberry or vanilla or chocolate or something. And um, yeah, chocolate is also really important. So we don't need to look at that in detail. That's a description of an Aztec um, banquet of um, Montezuma II or the Spanish Moctezuma, um, who was the ruler when the Spanish arrived to the New World, and um, they described um, yeah, what his eating habits were like. There were always many, many plates prepared for him, 30 plates for every meal and 1,000 extra dishes for his staff. And he really enjoyed tortillas and also chocolate cacao at the end of his meals. I think that's the most important aspect about that. And chili peppers. Yeah, so tortilla, in case you were wondering what um, tortilla is, but I think it's pretty famous nowadays. I couldn't get um, Maize tortilla, but I have some tortilla here. you. Let's go and have a look at it. It's tortilla de harina de trigo. So it's sweet, you can, you can buy that. I'm not going to say where it is. I don't want to. I don't get paid for that. I mean, I'm not saying. And you can also have a look at that. That's actually for preparing atole. So in case you're interested, you want to see what it looks like. And I also have some chili peppers here in cans. Yeah, so those are from Mexico. If you want, you can have a look at them later on. Yeah, so tortillas are really important and part of almost all the Mexican dishes, and they serve as a wrapping of stew, and that way a taco can be made. They can be small or really bigger when they are smaller, they, are, they can be called tortillinas, so they're small tortillas. Yeah, so two really important and really well-known um, pre-Hispanic people are the Maya people and the Aztec people. So the Maya people really mainly um, ate corn, pozol, which is a drink, or tamales, which I will talk about later. Something that's still really important today. Here we have a description by Diego de Nanda. Um, who was also a Spaniard who was really into Mayan people and um, actually died in Merida, Merida is in Yucatan, so at the Gulf of Mexico in, in the east, southern, southeast. And he was a Franciscan missionary. Yeah, but we don't have to read that because I think it's going to be a little bit long. So, yeah, it's just you have an impression, so you have an impression of a, of a pre Hispanic kitchen. Of course, this. Yeah, it wasn't back then, but um, as you can see, pre-Hispanic kitchen style still exists today. And there you can see the coman. The coman is... That's the coman. So that plate. Yeah, and there's not a lot of furniture in there. And you can see that there's a lot of smoke. I'll talk about that later, which is really risky for your health, which is... Um, yeah, why we are actually um, working with an organization in Mexico to change that a little bit, but I'll talk about that later. But I thought it's good story. Sorry? So today you can't find them anymore. Sorry? You I mean, yes, you can. can. <laughs> okay, so that's why they are, you are trying to fight against. Yeah. Because it's yeah. written pre. Oh, pre Hispanic, yes. sorry. Uh, Not pre Hispanic. Yeah. Okay, pre Hispanic. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you're right. Don't worry, yeah. But um, back then it was a little bit like that. I think there wasn't a table because they ate on the floor. 
and they used mats and they didn't have utensils, so they didn't have forks, they didn't have knives, they just used a tortilla to serve themselves right from the pot and yeah, ate the food like that. So, yeah. So nowadays you can still find them? Yes, you can still find them. They are really common actually, for example, in Oaxaca in one province. Um, I will show you, show you more about it later. But as you can see, that black smoke isn't really, it doesn't really look all that healthy and that's why people are trying to change that but without really interfering with their traditions. So, yeah, yeah. as I said, I will refer back to that later with some pictures. But let's move to the next stage, to the arrival of the Spanish and to the new cooking techniques. So what is important to know, the Mexican food as we know it today was actually established in the 16th century. So of course it's not like it used to be in pre-Hispanic times, but with the combination of European, European food items and um, pre-Hispanic food items, we get what is now the Mexican diet. So the food in New Spain, yeah. Um, there were maybe six really important items, which were wheat, um, meat and its derivatives, such as milk, cheese and eggs. So there was this really funny rumor in Mexico when I was there that quesadillas um, were pre-Hispanic because it means like um, tortilla doblada, like folded tortilla. But that can't be true because there was no cheese back then, so I mean... It doesn't, it doesn't really mean that it's not now or anything. It's really something that was invented when the European, um, Europeans came. Well, eggs and sugar and citrus fruits. So there was no lime and no lemon before the European people came. But maybe the quesadilla was something else without cheese? It's possible to just fold the tortilla. Yeah, but the ques quesadilla as it is today didn't exist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even though there's still a, a little debate going on because actually in Mexico City, quesadilla doesn't have to include cheese, yeah, yeah, which was really funny for me when yeah. I was there because quesadillas, it's like queso, queso means cheese. But yeah, I don't know. In other states, it's pretty common that there's cheese in quesadilla. And what about meat? Meat? Well, different meat because, as I said before, so, they ate dogs, but then the Spanish um, brought sheep and cows and pigs and, and chicken. Yeah, and pre Hispanic people or well, natives really adapted quickly to chicken and they could really use that really well. Maybe yeah. it has a taste similar to dog. <laughs> Maybe it does, who knows? I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to tell. Yeah, also onions, they didn't have onions before, and garlic and herbs like parsley or coriander. Yeah, what we also have to know is that um, um, the Arabic people ruled over Spain for quite some time. So um, at that time, when, when the Spanish conquered the area, which is now known as Mexico, they were of course the, themselves really influenced by Arabic food. So that's why today in Mexico we have rice and sweets and candied fruits. So an example would be alfajores, for example, which you can see here on the left, which is made out of coconut. I guess, yeah, coconut. And I, somewhere I read there can also be corn in it, but I'm not really sure. There are really different styles of alfajores. Well, with that al, you can always, always see that it has something to do with an Arabic origin. And albondigas on the right, which are meatballs, and that word actually dates back to, to yeah, that period when Arabic people were still ruling over the area which we know now as Spain. And albondigas are like meatballs filled with cooked eggs, for example. And yeah, on the right side, in a caldo de jitomate, so in a like, tomato broth. And you can see the rice as well. So, yeah, so the criollos and the mestizos, the criollos are the ones um, with Spanish parents born um, in Mexico in this case, and mestizos were the ones who had like a 
indigenous and Spanish parents, so like mixed. And they were the ones who grew up with both foods, with both, ki both kitchens, and they were actually really important. Um, and the cooks who worked in the open air markets really began blending those two food traditions. Um, yeah, and that's that's when quesadillas and sopes and antojitos were really invented. So just so you have an idea, quesadillas are made with indigenous tortillas and with European cheese and served with chili peppers and green tomato sauce. It doesn't have to be that way always, but most of the time. And sopas are small round tortillas and they are prepared with pork bits and complemented with spicy chili sauce. And there are lots of more, um, lots of more um, antojitos. Antojitos means like something like little appetizers, even though they are not really appetizers, they can really serve as a meal. And you can eat lots of antojitos and that doesn't really mean that you have to eat a plato principa afterwards. Gorditas, what is it? Gorditas means like little fat ones, actually. <laughs> I will show you I will show you a picture right now. It doesn't refer to people. <laughs> well gorditas, it really depends. In all of the states of Mexico, they use different names for this antifitas, so it will be really hard for me now to tell you. Yeah, this is a gordita because then some of you will say, yeah, but that's not a gordita, that's a picada or something, that's a memela. Because, yeah, they use different names everywhere. What would be a gordita for me, because that's what, what they use in Veracruz would be that one. For me, I don't know what about you. So for, 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 for that's something. That's something for you, yes. <laughs> and maybe that's memela for Luis, I'm not really sure. But um, what you can actually do on that day, on the 7th of March, so next week on Friday, you can actually learn how to prepare those. So that's really so in quite in interesting. In Mexico City, a gordita is, uh, is made of a maize stone, or I don't know, but it's closed. So you yeah. put the meat inside, and then to make a small bowl meat inside, with a flat, and cook it like that. So, so they are also vegetarian. Or vegetarian, yes. Vegetarian. So whatever you want to put inside, and when it's cooked, you open it, so you can put some cream and green sauce or chili sauce inside. So that's in Mexico City. I don't know if it's in the north. It's yeah, right. Mm -hmm. uh, because we just want to uh, <laughs> talking about that the uh, even antojitos have different names in different areas in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Little fat ones. They are fried after all. So that's maybe why they are little fat ones. Um, the ones on the left here, I think we can all agree that those are quesadillas. I think that's the same in all Mexico. Someone is objecting. <laughs> and at the bottom on the on the right there, those are flautas. Flauta means flute because they look like flutes. They are also fried tortillas, which we roll up the way that they look like a flute and they're um, it can be pollo, like chicken inside, mostly it, I think it's chicken, or sometimes it's also cheese, right? Chicken or cheese, and we put cream on top and avocado, that's really nice. Yeah. So yes, if you want to learn how to do those, you should really go to our taller, which is on the 7th of March, next week, as I said, at 5.30. And if you're interested, you can just mail us um, contact at mexico.de. You can also read that afterwards. Just some the information on that. Are you going to ask something? You can. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, which oh, well, yeah. Can we um, yeah, but this one? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. The picture is yeah. that's gorditas for me. Exactly. Yeah. For, yeah. for me, too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You see, yeah. in, 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 in the bottom, you see the bottom in the middle, that's gorditas. I think that's probably most of it. Because the insofas, they use powders. Also gorditas. And then normally it's really close. I mean, that doesn't. No, it's closed. Then you open and put like 
It's closed up for you, Coco. So you can yeah. completely close. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then you open it. Yeah, the thing is, I, I don't know. I mean, um, from a tray, I only know that it's going to close. Like, the corners and things and stuff in there. Just in there. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if, it's, if it's a bit too long, then it's yes. not going to be. Yeah. 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 And then you can open it. It's not going to be. Like the one on the left, uh, or in the yeah. o- yes. upper part, yes. Yeah, yeah that's not that good. Okay. It's closed, but then you put everything on the top. You don't open it. Right. Mm-hmm. That's not good. It's weird. Yes. 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 They're very specific. No, it's <laughs> specific. It's just like mice are sweet. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I'll also talk about the different kinds of names. <laughs> you can have a look at the picture and see them. Yeah, so since we're in the Catholic Church, I will talk about the role of the Catholic Church in food history. But even if we weren't, I would also talk about it because it was quite important. Since about 1523, many convents and monasteries were founded in La Nueva España, New Spain. So. They didn't um, only consist of churches and rooms for the priests, but also of orchards and gardens. So they actually started planting things in the convents. And um, as soon as those plants adapted to the new soil and to the climate, um, also other people outside the convent started using them. So the Catholic Church is actually quite important. Um, and. They also started celebrating the posadas, something we celebrated yet last year here during the Christmas season, and um, produced many sweets and also with many desserts. And yeah, they reproduced recipes from Spain, but they also used um, ingredients um, which were local there. Yeah, so what was actually invented in the convents is, for example, mole poblano. Chiles and no garden and from Pope. Yes. So I have a question. Yes. Yes. Oh, Posadas, okay. Tanya? Yeah. Posada, you said? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it is um, a pre Christmas party in Mexico. So before Christmas is on the ninth of uh, in the ninth of twenty four. So starting on the sixteenth, the people made the celebration, they were sending the way um, Mary and Joseph uh, were traveling from one town to the other asking for a place to stay. So posada, it means you are asking for um, accommodation. Accommodation, exactly. You are asking for accommodation, yeah. so you go asking for posada. Mm-hmm. So there, there are people going from one. Uh, the tradition now is that uh, a group of people is arriving to a house and asking for, for accommodation, and there's a group of people inside waiting for them. And now that you are missing a traditional song, so we did that with this last December here, but actually here. And then you, you invite them to come inside and offer food and so on, and then after that it's now it's a party. But the tradition is that to represent Maria and Joseph mm-hmm. and uh, travel before Christmas. And uh, the piñatas are, uh, if you have heard about piñatas? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Well, it is, it is uh, another tradition also, especially for this for this period. It's, it was invented or it's traditional in Mexico. In other parts of the world, it is something like that, also in Denmark. Mm-hmm. It, it is a it is a pot um, full of food inside and fruits mainly. So before yes. the times, it was full of fruits and decorated outside. And you see a bit of clay, but now it doesn't have to be that way. Just use like paper and actually just blow up a balloon and put like wet paper around it, wait for it to dry, and then you just decorate it really colorful. And there are all different kinds of pinatas like Dora Rice, Dora Dora, like I don't know, like, whatever, or SpongeBob or whatever. Yeah, and yeah, and then, then the tradition is that you break it because then you are, you are uh, because of the evil. And then everybody so, runs and tries yeah. to get mm-hmm. the most candy because the candy falls down. Mm-hmm. So it's like the ones you're over with your sons, you're absolutely. 
Yes, that was also invented back then. Yeah, it's back to the lot of what? Maybe it was the clay. So they invented tra traditional dishes back then, mole poblano, which you can see on the left, and chiles and morgana in the middle, and on the right, and many sweets and Many people actually used catering from the churches, so the nuns prepared food and brought it to people's homes when they were having festive dinners, for example. So, yeah, mole poblano, what is that? You can see that here. Mole is something really important in Mexico. So, mole has many, many ingredients, can have like more than 60 ingredients, for example. A friend of mine wrote a really long um, essay about it. They evolved all the ingredients, so yeah. So there can be turkey in it, chiles, chocolate, tomatoes, peanuts, and also things the Europeans brought, like lard, onions, garlic, and we see black peppers, cloves, cinnamon, almonds, pecans, farina, sesame, cumin seeds, many things. So it's a really nice sauce. It looks like chocolate sauce, but it doesn't really taste it's just like chocolate, it's really peculiar taste. So that was invented by the nuts. Yeah, and just so you get an idea what those friars ate, most of them ate like five times a day, so before they got out of bed, they had a cup of hot chocolate and some sweet bread, pan dulce, mm -hmm. and then they, they had breakfast at around nine o'clock, they had some rice, some lamb or pork and fried beans, then they had a meal at noon with a bowl of grass, so, um, caldo, uh, one or two stews of meat and vegetables and fruit and tea. And then at 3 o'clock they had another cup of chocolate. So as you can see, chocolate is just really, really important at all times. And then at supper they had some roast meat, some sour, and some hot chocolate, surprisingly. So, yeah, that's what they ate. I think they were quite lucky. Especially because of the sweet bread and the chocolate before getting out of bed. And yeah, um, because of the Spanish in Mexico, there was also lots of other foreign influence on the day because the Spanish actually um, conquered the Philippines sailing from Acapulco from the harbor and they established a trade route that um, lasted then about 250 years. So they brought cinnamon, nutmeg, cloves, black pepper, and so on. And they also um, brought the mango from Ceylon, from Sri Lanka, and from Malaysia. So the mango is not Mexican, but no, now it is. I don't mind. But it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Now it is. Now it is really Mexican, but it wasn't from Mexico originally. And they also brought the tamarind pots from oh. India. You can see those here. It's also a plant. It looks quite funny. And they even have a lot of chili. Of course, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's a really special one, and there's also a soda drink on tamarind base. Yeah, and also they um, wrapped some things from Africa, but they didn't really have um, a big hype um, upon the Mexican diet, so the things from Asia were actually more important. Yes, <laughs> now I'm... Um, if you ask about the food habits in New Spain, it's pretty difficult to say because there were many um, different social and cultural level levels. And but what I can say is that the indigenous population continued eating their traditional diet based on corn, beans, and chili, and they really like chicken. And but the urban indigenous really um, um, yeah, started to also include European food items in their diet. And so, yeah. More or less like that. Now let's move on to the 19th century already because in between there wasn't really all that much going on, not, not much other um, influence arrived to Mexico. But what is really important that there was some kind of mini culinary revolution. Um, in 1821, Mexico was independent of Spain. 
So the spirit of nationalism prevailed there, and pride, and they really wanted to have some typical Mexican food. And um, they kind of began to reject a little bit those items um, which came in from Spain, but well, they couldn't do that very long because that diet was already pretty much established. Many travelers um, who came to Mexico during that time were always really impressed about the dependence of Mexicans on corn and on the great quantity of chili peppers they consumed. I think that didn't really change. That's still the same today. Especially, I was also impressed about the same things. And then um, there was a really short period of three years, um, 1864 till 67, when Maximiliano and Carlotta from Austria um, were the emperors of Mexico, and they introduced the French cuisine to the upper class of Mexicans. And even though that was really a short period of time, okay, wait, um, it really had an impact on the food. And this is just an example of a kitchen back then. That's um, not the original, but that's um, yeah, a copy of Benito Juarez's kitchen. And he was the first indigenous president of Mexico. And the only one. And the only oh, one yeah. until to, yes, until today. But at least there was one. So as you can say, there is a comal again. So the comal is still there. And lots of clay. And here you can see a plaqueta where you were grinding corn and chilies, chilies, for example. Yeah, so, so this French cuisine was really, um, had really had an impact and it um, also continued during the presidency of Porifidio Diaz, which was more of a dictatorship actually, but also a presidency, <laughs> because he was the president. And um, yeah, he tried to make people believe that maize, so corn, was actually bad for your health and you should really eat wheat bread because that was really better, and French people also eat wheat bread, and they tried to change Mexican food habits, but it didn't really work all that well, because in the end, they found out that the nutritional value of wheat and maize is actually quite similar. Maize even has a little bit less fats than wheat. So, yeah. Well, but yeah, it depends which kind of wheat you use, of course, and what you produce with it. But in the end, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. So they couldn't really hold up that point. Yeah, and since we already talked about the different kinds of maize, as you can see here, there is not only that yellow one we all know, but there are many different types of maize. And of course, that also makes the tortillas in the end look different, so we can have like bluish tortillas and purple tortillas and really colorful tortillas really nice ones and then also colorful quesadillas and so on and there is also something I want I would like to tell you about which looks like this which is the corn fungus so it's like pigs and it's used in tacos or as a vegetable and in recent years it has become a really important element in Mexican food cuisine in the form of the pasta with la cochin. Sorry. No. <laughs> yeah, and when um, when it, yeah the rainy season starts, those can be found um, in the markets because yeah then the um, fungus really grows well on the maize. And it's not dangerous for your health. It might be a little bit weird, but it's really tasty, really good. So that's what it looks like. With la coche, which is of course also indigenous as you can hear. Now let's move to the 20th century. So, oh yeah. so from 1910 till 1920, there was a Mexican revolution going on, and we had a big demographic change. Um, especially in the 50s, or, um, yeah, happened lots of urbanizations, so many people moved to the cities, and yeah, the government was forced to really change the food system, and yeah, 
because of the urbanizations, many people started to create fondas, like street stands or like little little um, restaurants, but really cheap restaurants, and served foods from their region. So um, this regional distribution changed a little bit everything, blended in some more. For example, in Mexico City, I think you can find almost all varieties from the different regions. Regions now it's not all nice and separate anymore. And in the 1930s, um, transnational food companies also began um, to set up business in Mexico, like Nestle from Switzerland, for example. Which is so a very bad one. <laughs> <laughs> so there is. I'm not trying to judge it. So there is yeah. Nescafe today, and it's, it's and it's actually important to say that even though Mexicans might not be as proud of it as of their quesadillas or other stuff, it's really important and most people consume a lot of Nescafe. Rather than their own cafe, they have really, really nice cafe in Mexico, but they rather drink Nescafe, which is from the States. Yes. And, and many people, yeah. And in the 1950s, McCormick also started like Orange Crush and also, of course, Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Those are the fondas, and um, this is one in Jalapa called um, El Itacaca or something like that. Let me check. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, El Itacaca, also now. It is yeah, in, in downtown Jalapa. So that's what they look like, really like a mixture between cafeteria and restaurant and it's pretty cheap to eat there. It looks like but it doesn't look that cheap. Yeah, it looks pretty, right? But it is really cheap. So if you pay like forty pesos there, which is like approximately two to three euros, you can get a whole meal. You can actually get a soup or rice. You can have a main plate. It's more more expensive in Mexico City, but in Canada it's pretty cheap. And also some dessert and something they call agua de fruta, fruit water, or other drinks. So, so that's pretty nice. It's subsidized. No, no, no. It's true. That's the point. <laughs> yeah, but yes. why is it cheap? Why is it cheap? Because we're Mexicans. Yeah, but also, <laughs> the, 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 in one of the slides, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, try to explain that the idea of the fonda is that you, it's like a um, midday menu. You only have one or two. So you will always get a soup, a rice, a main dish, and from these main dishes you may choose only others from the vegetarian and other dishes. And this, uh, so it's uh, it's called comida corrida, uh, which is maybe one in one in food because you just you have a whole menu and you cannot choose, and this uh, that's why it's very cheap. Some and it's mainly mainly kind of homemade, so the people who work in the you know, the, the place is like a, it's a home. Yeah, and it doesn't have to look like that. That one looks really nice, but it can also be just a garage mm -hmm. and some brand other cooking there. But the quality is mostly high. You were asking about why you said like the government had, had to subsidize food. It's because just many they um, dem there was a demographic change, so so okay. there started to be many more people. So what um, Mexico was producing had to be distributed. Better, so also prices couldn't be that high because there weren't a lot of uh, working places. That's why those founders actually started um, to exist in Mexico City and other big cities. Yeah, so what is also important that there have been more profound changes in the Mexican food system and the eating habits in the last 50 or 60 years than in the preceding 400 years. So because of the technological improvement or change in cooking aids, most importantly the invention of the corn grinding mill to make mixtamal. Mixtamal is a way of separating the corn from its yeah, skin uh -huh. and then um, adding water to it and yeah, making masa harina. So um, from masa harina, from, from that special um, type of flour, you can then make tortillas or also tamales, which I will show you now in a second. So, yeah, 
Here it says that women cooks in the neighborhoods of Clara, for example, continue to pad their tortillas by hand until well into the 1980s, but also in other communities you can see that it is that way. Just this one was one which really rejected um, those new cooking eggs a lot. And also the electric blender, of course, for soups and sauces, um, but still many households have a mortar and a pestle. To prepare food carefully for special special occasions, and in 1949, Yamasa Arina was then um, invented, which is like kind of a dehydrated tortilla flour. So you just have to buy that, and you don't have to actually do that really long process of mixtanalization. But you can just add water to that flour and then make your tortilla. So that's a lot easier. Why Frida Kahlo? Well, I had to put it here because in her Casa Azul, the, the blue house, which was one of her houses in Coyoacan, Mexico City, um, that is actually her kitchen. And I think it's quite nice that you can see that she also still had many, well, of course, there was no blender back then, but she had many pre Hispanic kitchen utensils there. You can see that really big one. Um, yeah, which is for mole. So it takes lots of time to prepare. I don't know, it can be a week or three days, but mostly a week. Did she finally know how to cook or not really? I mean, she did, she did. did. Mm -hmm. And the casa is so there. Because of the. Yeah, but I think <laughs> because of friends. his ex wife's um, yeah, uh, cooking, she, she learned, right? I mean, the ex wife told her how to. So I mean, oh, that's, that's what it is in the movie. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know about yeah. that, but um, there are many, many books about her recipes, and she also had really big dinner parties. And um, yeah, there's one book I will recommend for you when I'm done. So if you want to check, you can read that one. It's about um, Frida's fiestas. Uh -huh. Yeah, and this is Puebla style here actually. Those. Yeah. There's one thing is the relation parts. Diego Rivera uh, has uh, a secret that she was not cooked, uh, and so he was good eating. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, there might be a big Probably knew how to eat it before. Yeah, he was so already he was like so this way. When he got to know him. Yeah, he was really like that. I also don't know if Diego uh, Rivera, also a painter, didn't he also, also, also like that. Yeah. So he has. Um, um, uh, he has. Um, yeah, Stimmungsschwankungen. Ja. Mood swings. And Frida konnte das ausgleichen mit Essen. And that's why Diego also. But she treated, she she treated his mood swings. With food. Yeah. That's smart. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now we're in the 20th, well, in the 20th century. So in 1994, there, there was something really important the North American Free Trade Agreement with Canada and the US. So the opening of Mexican borders and markets to import food, um, food products and electric domestic products, which wasn't only that. Only nice for Mexico, let's say, which there was actually a lot of resistance. For example, this campaign, Sin Maiz No País, meaning without maize there isn't a country. So, this national campaign was against those big monopoles, um, and yeah, they started that in 2007, and they are against that treaty and they want a renegotiation of the treaty because. Um, yeah, many U.S. companies import maize to Mexico um, at a cheaper price. So that's why Mexico can, can't really be self-reliant anymore on its products. And that's actually pretty, pretty bad for the economy. So yeah, it's, it was supposed to be good, but there are lots of disadvantages. But since I'm not an economist, um, I wouldn't want to talk about that too long, but if you're interested in it, you can just check cinemaismoipais.org. That's their page, and they explain in length what their campaign is about and also 
what is so bad about the North American Free Trade Agreement. Okay, let's let's sum up what we were talking about. So the Mesoamerican plants, as you can see here, were corn, bean, and squash, which is referred to as the triad of native Mexican agriculture. Why is that so? Because those those three plants were actually um, cultivated together on one field. So there wasn't a separate field for corn, bean, and squash, but those were together because they all. I'm also not a biologist, so that's what, just what I read. And they all require different uh, nu nutrients from from um, the soil, so that's they that's why they work really well together. So um, yeah, lately they have been trying to use that system again in Mexico and not have like lots of big corn fields because that actually doesn't make that much sense because it really ruins the soil. And yeah, that's why this is called the triad of native Mexican agriculture, because the natives, the pre-Hispanic people, used to do that as well. And then tomatoes, chili peppers, amaranth. You, you all know what that is? Yes? So in Mexico, they mostly sell alegrinas. It's like forbidden. <laughs> uh, which are like um, amaranth bars. In Mexico City, you buy them on the metro. Even you shouldn't, if that's not enough. but as mostly where they sell them, and they can really keep you um, with energy for a long time because they're really nutritive. And well, nopal, do you know what nopal is? Nopal is cactus. So, next to the people do eat cactus, and it's quite delicious, I have to say, and it doesn't hurt you when you eat it because you fry it in the pan, and in case there is still some little thorns, yeah, thorns left, and um, those are burned while you um, fry them in the pan, so it's really not a problem, and they're really nice with the cheese on top. Really good. Chayote. <sighs> yeah, I know. Chayote. How can I explain chayote? But chayote looks like a greenish, wobbly kind of vegetable. You can also cook it. It's like, for me, it's like a mixture between cucumber and celery or something. I don't know <laughs> what everyone says. It's hard for me to decide what it is because I don't think we have that here. Or chocolate, we talked a lot about the chocolate. Picama is a little bit like kohlrabi. Mm -hmm. yeah. And most people eat it with ch chile on top and lemon and salt. <laughs> yeah, plantains, or also known as platano macho, or bananen. So, um, yeah, bananas you can cook, and tropical fruits, all from the European Union, and Turkey. Yeah, and then with, with the arrival of the Europeans, we have citrus fruits, um, fruits like apples, pears, and so on. Also, the mangoes, which came from Sri Lanka, as I said. Um, melons, watermelons, strawberries, and so on, and the meat, beef, mutton, pork, chicken, rice. We learned that this is because of the Arabic influence. Spices like cinnamon, cumin, seeds, um, sesame seeds, any seed, cloves, and so on. And also sugar, there wasn't any sugar you put in wheat. Some said before, among the, the Europeans, uh, their cuisine is much healthier. Yeah. Without sugar, without meat, a lot of vegetables. It sounds healthy. Yeah. Sounds pretty good, yeah. Also, their agriculture was really developed and really smart, so yeah, people should study them more and not, not try to use so many machinery nowadays, maybe. They maybe. Even, they even used to clean the teeth to the, the bone. So, <laughs> so pretty smart. Yeah, the tortilla serves for a lot of purposes. Yeah. Now I have a little little poem. And that's what I'm actually doing. I look at Chicano literature. So, um, those of you who maybe know William Carlos Williams, he's um, yeah. is an important American author, and he had a poem which went like, "I have eaten the plums." 
that were in the icebox and which you were probably having for breakfast. I'm sorry, they were so nice and juicy and so cold. So this is the variation on that theme by Tino Villanueva. Um, so with, with Mexican roots living in the States. And I think it shows pretty well how important tamales are. So now finally I will show you what tamales are. And yeah, I think the contrast is pretty nice between that before it was something ice cold and then it was something hot. So maybe also something about identity here. So yeah, that that's what tamales are. Tamales are festive foods made for special occasions mostly, but nowadays you can also buy them on the streets. Um, you can have them at first communion breakfast, at children's parties, weddings, on the altar of the Dia de Muertos, Tag der Toten, Day of the Dead, and on the Dia de, Can de Candelaria, which is in German something like Maria Lichtmess, I looked up, so it's like 40 days after Christmas, and well, there's this tradition on the 6th of January, on the, on the um, yeah, there is. Three mm. Kings Day. Three Kings Day. Three Kings Day. Sounds hard. Um, you know, Three Kings Day. So when was Three Kings Day? Well, on that day, anyway, on the same day. Nativity. Of, sorry. Nativity. No, no, that's, no, you you will mean the play or on the sixth of January. So, on that day, those three kings are supposed to arrive to bring gifts to baby Jesus and that's also celebrated in many countries, many Spanish-speaking countries as well. So on that day there is something you have which is called Rosca de Reyes, which is some kind of bread, which is like circular and with, sometimes with colors on top, but something really important is that someone will have a piece of bread where there is a little baby Jesus nowadays. It's made out of plastic, I heard before it was some other material, but now it's plastic. Mm. And if you happen to have that little baby Jesus in your piece of bread, you have to make tamales for everyone on the Dia de Candelaria. So on February 2nd, you have to make lots of tamales. And it's quite tiring to make tamales. So <laughs> I don't know if you're happy about that, but everyone else certainly is. So that can happen with the Rosca de Reyes. And the tradition actually exists in Spain as well and in France. I mean, it just. They have a variation of it, it's a bit different there, so I guess, but, yeah, that's mm. what they have No, I don't think so. Not But not tamales, no, <laughs> it's just the, 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 the blood. Yeah. yeah. I don't think so. Is it on 6th? So much fun. You said it was on 6th of January? The arrival of the Mm-hmm. Yes. So tamales are prepared with the same corn dough, so the masa used for tortillas, and then you beat that with lard, and, and lard, do you know what that is? That is like um, some kind of fat from pork, like manteca, manteca, is it? I, wouldn't, I don't know what, schmeiß, schmeiß, schwein, schmeiß, ah yeah, okay, schwein, schmeiß, and then you stuff it with a diversity of fillings, so here you can see that there is some red um, chili salsa, probably, maybe chili chipotle, I don't know. And they are prepared um, by putting corn dough inside a corn husk, so yeah, that leaf there, and you add maybe chili, pepper, salt, or chicken, or pork, or sometimes beans, or other things. In Oaxaca there are actually many, many varieties, so on the 7th of March you can ask Luis about it, because he is from Oaxaca. So then you steam those um, in a pot and so that there doesn't come any water in it, you have to fold them like little gifts, which is quite cute. And then they also take up a little bit of that flavor of the corn or of the platano leaves, so the banana leaf. And there are, there's also a sweet version which is prepared with raisins or other fruits and mostly the masa, so the um, corn dough is colored with pale pink food color. And I don't know why I tried to find out, I don't know why they do that, but they do it and I used to think that it was the fresa with strawberries, but it's not. It's just food coloring, that was a big disappointment for me. And I don't know, but someday maybe I will find out why. 
So yes, yeah, I said in the regions of Oaxaca and also Chiapas, they include a large variety of tamales in their food traditions. I think it is called epiphany. Epiphany. Yeah. 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 I knew epiphany, but in another context. Yes, but it is a epiphany. Okay. So it's that. That is tradition. But yeah, I didn't know the English. So it's epiphany bread you eat, and there's <laughs> Jesus beer in it. Yes. So one thing I want to make clear that of course you can generalize um, what Mexican food is like. So it's not all the same because Mexico's many different states, as you can see here. And if you want to try to group their food habits a little bit, you can do it this way. You can say that northern Mexico, for example, so the states bordering with the U.S. are mostly influenced by U.S. food, and yeah, the one at the Pacific. Pacific coast might have same food habits, common food habits, while the one at the Yucatan Peninsula there on the right, where the Mayas um, used to live there and in Guatemala. They probably have still more traditions from the Maya people than other regions, yeah, central Mexico and yeah, that's just, that's just some some way to group them better according to their geography. And maybe some other time we can talk about it more. So, what are typical Mexican meals? We're almost almost done. So, of course, it really depends on the cultural group, on the setting, whether we're in the city or not, on the age group, on the um, socioeconomic level, and also the region, as I said. But what you can really say is true for all of them, then that corn is eaten everywhere, beans, squash, so if you need to go this way. Um, yeah, and also chili peppers, tomatoes, tomatillos in the form of the basic diet. Yeah. And secondary food items which are important are, for example, nopales, so cactus, avocado, chayotes, licamas, quintoniles, and quelites, verdolagas, bisnagas, tunas. So these are all fruits, but <laughs> it's so hard for me to explain, so maybe yeah, if you're interested, Later, I can show you that transparency again. You can just Google for an image, because when I tried to find out about it, I could just find Latin names, and I, I'm not sure if that would really <coughs> help. So because we don't have those, so it's a little bit hard to translate. Yeah, and tortillas and hot chili sauces um, accompany meals throughout all Mexico and all um, social levels. And what is mostly there on the table when you eat are is salt and cut limes on a little plate as an accessory. Yeah. So, <laughs> this is a photo from a project by Peter Ansel, um, an American, and it's called Hungry Planet, What the World Eats. Mm -hmm. So he traveled around the world and asked like average families to um, get to group together all the food items they would buy for one week. So that's what this family mm -hmm. eats in one week, the um, Casales family in Cuernavaca. So as you can see, there's, um, there's most of the stuff we talked about. And there are also Banti and Bolillos, most of the fruits we talked about. But there's also lots of Coke. So a little fun fact, Mexico is the country with the highest Coca-Cola consume in all the world. <laughs> yeah. So I don't think you should get a prize for that. <laughs> no, no, there's no, there's no prize for it, but but it's a fact. Yeah, it's like that. So they sell lots of Coke and Coca Cola as Earning. That's what they do with their drinking Coke. Thank you. Cocoa. Cocoa. Mm, sounds like it. Yeah, maybe it all comes back to cocoa at the end. No. Yeah, that's of course just an example. So not every family is like that, but I thought it was pretty interesting. If you're interested in that, you can Google that. There are many um, pages for that. And there's also, if you happen to be in Oslo, one of the states, there is an ex exhibition there where you can look at all of the pictures in the Nobel Peace Center in Moscow. 
So yeah. Um, concluding, a national cuisine is influenced by the invaders, the conquerors, and the commercial context, of course, and for the Mexican cuisine, um, the Spaniards and Americans, and to a lesser degree, the French, English, Chinese, and Japanese immigrants in the 19th century were important. That's something we can also skip, but that's something I work with just to show you what is Mexican food like in the US. So it's a really great success, as you know. And Mex Mexican or Tex-Mex food, as we know, it originated mostly in San Antonio because that was where the railway passed and that was a really important logistical point. And they also had maybe chili stands there and sold tamales, beans, and tortillas. And yeah, because of that, many people started to think that Mexican food was actually from San Antonio. Yeah, the first tortilleria was opened there in 1924. Yes, sorry to interrupt you. Why are they? Uh, why were they sold at night? I don't know. It was just the tradition at night when people were hungry and went out to have a little snack. It's actually still that way in Mexico and most most cities. As far as I know, <laughs> pretty late at night, like at 2 o'clock at night, you can still get stuff on, on the streets. Not everywhere in Mexico City, there it's actually the other way around because they really closed everything pretty early. Where I used to live, it was like that. I don't know, it was just some part of eating culture at night there. And they also had lots of eateries, so like the fondas we were already talking about. Also quite important. And there was a German immigrant who was important, since we're in Germany, I'm going to mention that. Gebhardt, he was the first entrepreneur to produce canned Mexican food. So she made tamales. Mm. Tamales in cans. In 1911. Oh so that. So, that's it's why we have Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> that is really important that you know about it. That's why I wouldn't want to leave that out. So that's a franchise franchise of um, fast food, as you know, and it exists since um, 62. Mm, originated in Bernardino, um, California. Yeah, and that's what most people refer to as Tex-Mex. So as you can see, those are supposed to be tacos. And well, these are some kind of corn shells. But a taco doesn't look like that. A taco has to have, yeah, better with, with um, maize, but that is with wheat. A taco has to have something like that or something smaller like that with meat, but not some toasted shell. Well, but that's Tex-Mex. That's also a different cuisine, and it's also there, but it's really different. I would have to admit that it's really different. And it shows that amalgamation between the U.S. and Mexico. So you can already see in the linguistic point here, big mass with more. Yeah. Uh, Lancôme, you don't have to read it all, it's by Barbara Brinson Courier. Um, it's called Recipe, Chorizo con huevo made in the microwave. So that um, reflects <laughs> upon um, the new technological inventions and she says, I, I won't lie, it's not the same when you taste the memories of Abuelita feeding wood into the stove will dim. You won't smell the black crisp of tortillas bubbling on cast iron. Microwave, they are pale and limp as Alvena Hafa. Heaven, um, a shadow of smoke. There's no eggy lace and scrape from the pen, no stutters of grease on the back of the stove. And everything is clean and vaporous and dribbless, and it's not the same. And she goes on like that. So there is a lot of instant Mexican food in this stage, which can't, they, the taste can't really actually be compared with the food uh, which is homemade and with like old foods and like kitchen supplies and kitchen aids. It's pretty different, she reflects it in that. Um, yeah, also Chicana, so a Mexican living in the States. And that's maybe what a Mexican kitchen might look like today. Mm, so gas stoves are pretty important because you can um, yeah, toast the tortillas on them. Microwaves are also really popular, of course, fridges and stuff, so that's maybe what it looked like. So, not all kitchens look like that. Some kitchens look like the one I showed you before, that one that had, that's had pre-Hispanic kitchen. 
So what we're doing, we, we work with Comuna, um, which is um, a Mexican civil association registered in 2010 in the state of Oaxaca. And the program we support is called Hogar Saludable, Healthy Home. And they um, construct ecological kitchens. Um, those um, ovens are called estufa patsari, with ov ovens that decrease the development of smoke and use up less firewood. And also, like that, there is a reduction of eye irritations and diseases. So yeah, that's what can happen, and that's not so nice for your health. And that's why they are trying to construct, um, yeah, different ovens there, but still like adapted to their way of life and to their traditions. So, <laughs> so if you go there, we won't put that money into our pockets, but we will give it to Comuna, and Comuna will help. Um, indigenous people in Oaxaca to yeah, to construct those kitchens and have a healthier life, but still um, yeah, according to their traditions. If you want to read more, you can read this for example. I read that and it was really interesting. It's called Foodscapes, Food Fields and Identities in Yucatan, which is where the Mayas used to live. Or this one is a really good one, Food Culture in Mexico. You can also ask me afterwards, or Que Vivan Los Tamales, Food and the Making of Mexican Identity, it's a nice one. It's a yeah. no, you, no, it's no. No, unfortunately it's not, you You would have to go to Berlin, it's in the EIE, um, uh, Latin American Institute, close to Potsdam Platz. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that one about maize, it's, an, it's a visual catalog, it's, it's really nice, and that picture was the different maze was from that book, for example. Or this one, which is the same, just about chili peppers. And that's the one I was talking about, Frida's Fiestas, Recipes and Reminiscences of Life, with Frida Kahlo, which is also a really nice book. Yeah, so that was it. And yeah, thank you all for listening. Sorry for <laughs> Okay, do you have any questions about anything, any transparency you want to see again? You're good. Maybe we can try to find some.